Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have Joe Gray here. He's going to be speaking with us about uh, 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 social engineering, using social engineering for pe penetration testing. He's going to be sharing with us a lot of uh, useful tools and techniques, advanced penetration tools and techniques. And um, he will also share with us some ethical considerations in social engineering. So welcome, Joe. Thank Thanks you. very much. Can everyone hear me OK? Or do I need the mic a little bit closer? OK, I know. I, I've got a very soft voice. So um, yes, I'm Joe Gray. I uh, will be talking about um, basically using open source intelligence, OSINT, to supercharge your um, social engineering attacks. But at the same time, at the very end, I'm going to drop a little bit of training wisdom as well because, well, not everyone in here is a red teamer. Not everyone in here wants to be a red teamer. And realistically, when you're writing your reports, you need to have recommendations. So here's a few for you to use. Um, before we get started, uh, mandatory thing here, uh, the thoughts and opinions are mine, mine alone. Do not reflect those of IBM. Uh, with that being said about me, I'm a senior security architect at IBM. Um, I used to be uh, a system admin, security engineer, uh, consultant, a little bit of everything. I won the 2017 DerbyCon Social Engineering Capture the Flag. Uh, I used to navigate submarines, and that's I'm being purely serious there. There's no jokes with that. Um, although I do still like to watch competitive submarine racing from time to time. Um, I do write blogs from time to time as well. I have my own blog and podcast, Advanced Persistent Security, and I do tap out a lot in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, some people probably call it training, but I would say 98% of the time I'm tapping out. So, well, you know, Helio Gracie said you either win or you learn. I learn a lot. <laughs> anyway, so uh, with that being said, just to, uh, just want to share with you my goals. I just want to let you know about open source intelligence, about social engineering, various types of social engineering. We're not going to really get into the weeds about things like dumpster diving and baiting, although they're fun. Uh, that's really not what uh, I'm going for with this. We'll cover a little bit of the application of social engineering, using OSINT to do better social engineering, and then some uh, mitigation and training. So social engineering, it is the art of human hacking. It's taking human psychology, misusing it to get people to do or say things they should not do. Uh, if you want to read up on it, these three books are what I would recommend starting with. You have Christopher Hadnagy uh, on the left with Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking. I consider that a seminal work. Uh, Kevin Mitnick's Art of Deception, uh, that's also seminal in the field of social engineering. But then the center one is by Dr. Robert Cialdini, uh, Influence. And from that, we're going to get a concept that I'm going to cover later, the six principles of persuasion. He is a legit psychologist. He does not deal with social engineering. He's been on Christopher Hadnagy's podcast a few times, but he doesn't call people and get them to give him their passwords on a daily basis. He analyzes and does what psychologists do. So with the pioneers, in the top left here, we have Kevin Mitnick, uh, the top Right, we have Dr. Cialdini, Christopher Hadnagy on the bottom right. Uh, does anyone know who the gentleman on the bottom left is? Anybody? Anybody seen? Uh... Yes. Anybody saw this movie? That's who Leonardo DiCaprio uh, portrayed. So it's Frank Abengale. He's really a pioneer of social engineering before it was called social engineering. If you've seen the movie, you can think back to when he was buying those airplanes and soaking them in the bathtub to get the stickers to come off so he could put them on checks, which is not social engineering, but he's crafty about his impersonation. If you think about the scene with him uh, in the room, Tom Hanks comes in, he impersonates another law enforcement officer, hands him his wallet that has his badge in it, and all it was was wrappers off of everything that was in the room that he had folded up to feel like a badge. He told Tom Hanks, oh, yeah, uh, we've already captured him. He's going out to the car. There was a guy walking to the car. He's like, yeah, that's my, that's my partner. Tom Hanks looks out the window. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll sit here and wait, and we'll, we'll debrief it. I would like to be with you when we do the perp walk. And out the door he goes. Into the car he gets. He waves at Tom Hanks and leaves. Tom opens the wallet, sees what it is, and feels pretty dumb. 
It's okay. So examples of social engineering. We, we already know about phishing. It happens all the time, right? I mean, I, we would be hard pressed to find a single person in here with an email account, period. Everyone has them. I mean, children have them. Um, when I have children, I will probably score email accounts for them within their first month of life so that they don't have to fight for, so, for the same account later. And I might, I might even do something, um, sentimental and send them emails or something. I don't know. And be like, hey, you're old enough to read. Here, check your email. <laughs> I don't know. And I guarantee you, even though that would not be, I guarantee you that email address would still get spammed with phishing attempts, even though it would not be used for anything. Well, actually, I'd probably register social media accounts too, but completely different. Anyway, spear phishing, that's just ultra-focused phishing. You've got whaling, the big fish, right? Sea levels. That's my personal favorite, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Vishing, that's your voice phishing. That's when you call somebody from their phone number when they're drunk, and you start talking to them and convince them that you are their conscious. And they should do this or that. Not to say I've ever done that to somebody. Um, we've even moved to the point of using SMS texts for phishing. And that's what smishing is. And then we've got baiting. You know, uh, you get a thumb drive. Uh, you put um, a macro-enabled Word document with a few goodies on it. Uh, affix a sticker to it that says uh, company cutbacks, layoffs, bonuses. Uh, W2, competitive intelligence, I don't know, whatever. And you drop it. And you wait. One of my other favorite baits, I like to get posters printed and put in break rooms. Posters, those are innocuous, right? You can't do anything with that. Oh, I beg to differ. Because you can have a lot of fun with a QR code. You can actually build that out in the social engineer toolkit, put it up there. I guarantee you, like, I used to live in Atlanta. Uh, I've since moved, but I always made the joke, uh, there's that one part of town that's just nothing but hipsters, right? I guarantee you, I could bait that entire part of town with a single poster with two QR codes. Announce a Modest Mouse concert with $1 PBR and $3 craft beers. Must scan the QR code to get the free beer. I guarantee you, I'm probably going to get greater than 70% of that part of town. Guaranteed. And if you have a guy down the street with, like, a beard pitching it, especially if he's wearing flannel, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to go to, like, 85 easily. That I've never done. I've always joked about it. Dumpster diving, we, we know you're just basically pilfering through someone's trash to find out what they did not care about. You're trying to find things like spreadsheets, uh, passwords that people had written down. You might just find out about how things work. You might find vendor boxes. Knowing what technologies people use, that's very important. You do not want to go burn a Windows exploit in a Linux environment or vice versa. You don't want to try to attack a routing device with a Cisco exploit if it's Juniper, right? So knowing these things, this is all open source intelligence that you can actually use to do better social engineering. Tailgating, I mean, that one's easy. You find the smoking area of an organization. They all have them. You wait until everybody's out there, and you come strolling up like you own the place, have a badge, like if nothing else, just like um, a state password inspector badge, just a badge, uh, a lanyard similar to what they're, what they're wearing, and you stroll up with a dozen donuts and coffee. I've seen this myself. They will break their neck and put those cigarettes out, fight each other. It's like running of the bull for them to get to the door to let you in because they want a free donut. Alternatively, you can use ladders, you can have a toolbox. There's so many things you could do. Um, it's not just the smoking area, but they are easy targets. So, goals of social engineering. These are the six principles of persuasion. So we have reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, likability, authority, and urgency scarcity. So, if you want to think about how these are applied, Think about the last time you bought a used car. And I pick on salesmen with this all the time for one simple reason. Sales is basically social engineering. That's all it really is. So let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. I apologize to any salespeople I may have offended. But if you go back to that earlier slide and see those books I recommended, I guarantee you you'll get more sales if you follow the stuff ethically. 
But with that being said, so you're trying to buy a car and it's like, hey, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You pay an extra $300 for this car, I will throw in maintenance for life. Most of the time that package is only $250, but okay. Commitment and consistency. Man, I have been selling you cars for the last 25 years. I would not do you wrong. We have a good relationship. Social proof. You're there, you're looking at a Z4 Roadster, you know, you're just walking around, you don't have a ring on your finger, you're just chilling. Car salesman walks up, oh yeah, you get this thing, we'll be getting all the chicks. Yeah? All the cool kids are doing that. Okay, cool. Well, you know, I was really just looking at it because my oil is getting changed, but thanks. Um, urgency and scarcity. Oh yeah. There was a guy down here at the car lot the other day. Actually, he was just here about 25 minutes ago. He left, went to the bank to get financing. I tell you what, if you can get finance first, it's yours. There wasn't no guy there. Who goes to the bank to get financing for cars now? Most of the time, if you're going to do it the right way, you get financing before you even show up on the lot. And then you haggle them, haggle them, haggle them, let them think that they're about to make some money off of the financing agreement. And then you say, nope. I don't, I don't like that. I want to pay $500 less than what you're saying. Oh, we can't do that. I got cash money right here. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Works. Uh, the one I did not mention is authority. That one, it's a little bit trickier because car salesmen don't really have anything to use in terms of authority. You know, people working at big box retailers, they don't have it either. But what I will reference as an example would be uh, when you get that ransomware email, the, the fish that's trying to get you to click so that, that you can get the ransomware, and it says that multiple pornographies, bestiality, and all these other disgusting things have been found on your computer, click here and we will alert the Microsofts and get it eradicated from your system. <laughs> because it has the FBI warning that is using the authority. A while back in my previous life, I was doing a um, phone pretexting engagement, and my target was to keep it as vague as possible. They were kind of a government, kind of not. I'll just leave it at that. But I just called and said, hey, I'm operating on the authority of such and such, which I had found on the Internet as the leader of that organization. And um, he's commissioned this survey. Do you have like five minutes to answer these questions? And I'm going to tell you now, some of these questions are ridiculous. I just have to ask them because that's what he said to ask. And because I said such and such, and these people know such and such, they're like, yeah, I can make five minutes for such and such. Oh, thanks. So, and it, it worked because I'm using a name they are familiar with and it's an authoritative figure. So, with this, social engineering, we're trying to get people to do one of two things. You can boil it down. You either want them to tell you something or do something. Tell you things. Well, what's your password? Or actually, you know what? Um, what was your mom's name before she was married? Yeah, before she was married. I'm sorry? Okay. Um, I can now reset your password because that just got your mother's maiden name because I did not ask it as your mother's maiden name. Had I said that, you would have been like, yeah, no. I, I know. I should have took the mic. Alternatively, um, something I'll do around, like, when I'm at conferences, I'll just stroll up to people, random people in the street. I, I do it for fun, but I also do it to stay sharp. And I'll be like, so you from around here? Uh, you know, I grew up like 30 miles down the road. Oh, yeah, me too. I grew up on uh, Locust Street. What about you? Oh, did you go? Which, which school did you go to? Okay. Oh, no. Y'all were my rival. I can't talk to you. I'm sorry. I, well, I just can't. And at that, I've not said anything definitive. I've not really said much of anything, honestly. I've put a few things in their mouth in terms of things that I might know are right or wrong to get them to correct me or accept it. And, I mean, every city has the tree-named streets, Elm Street. Main Street, Main and Elm are just too cliche. I typically go with Locust or Walnut just because it's not as cliche. But anyway, something to that effect. Anyway, other things that we might try to get them to tell us, something that's not readily available. During the SCCTF, I uh, had a person on the phone. I was like, hey, um, can you press the little Windows icon in the bottom left-hand corner? Yeah, sure. Okay, now can you type B-I-T-L? Okay, it says BitLocker. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So, okay, that tells me, number one, they are using a Windows system. 
she is going to do whatever I ask her to do, and three, there's a good chance they're using BitLocker for encryption. Later on in the exercise, I had some, I called it one number, got forwarded to IT. The guy in IT, when I did that to him, he was like, well, yeah, it's Windows. Of course BitLocker's installed, but we use Symantec. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to his defense, though, I was spoofing an internal phone number, and I was calling from the Microsoft Office 365 Email Migrations Issues Hotline. I tried to call the number last night, and it is dead now. Their deputy CISO was in the room as it happened. He, t he turned green. He, he had just been talking on uh, Twitter a few days prior about how there was a major security event coming up for his company and he couldn't wait to see how well they withstood it. I hope he was not talking about that. And then like three months after the thing was over, I saw that he had viewed my profile on LinkedIn. I was like, hmm. <laughs> eh, whatever, here's a little salt for the wounds. Here's a connection request. <laughs> so, and then think about this with salespeople, right? Oh, you're not the decision maker? Oh, could you please tell me who, who is? Oh, you're not the right target? Tell me who the better target is. Thanks. Or think, think back to the last time you dealt with a security salesperson or just a technology salesperson in general. Tell me about the problems your organization faces. Oh. Oh, you say you're having Active Directory issues and, and your 2FA is not working? Mm. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs> Performing an action. We already know. Open an email, click a link. Here's another one that I'm a huge fan of. Call up their firewall administrators and get them to open like port 4444. It's a metasploit. Nothing big. Yeah, whatever. But if you can get them to open a port and let you in, why, why burn your exploits and beat your head against a wall trying to get a SQL injection to work on some ultra-segmented public-facing web server when you can get access to everything because you just got a firewall port opened? I mean, it might take a little bit more work and you might have to tiptoe tap dance and, and you know, do the ballet over the phone, but hey, you know, if you're like me and you talk a lot, it really doesn't matter. So, Transition. What is OSINT? It's basically anything that you can get from public information sources. Uh, the CIA actually has a definition on their website, and that's where I kind of get this from. And basically, you're getting it from various media sources, like mass media. Uh, another good place, conference proceedings, like IEEE conferences. When people come, they present things, and then they have to publish a paper. Yeah, that's a perfect place to do it. Why? Because people are talking about the technologies they're using, problems they face, and other things like that. So it works amazingly. We already know the internet. If you're going to do OSINT, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, your Google foo has to be strong. Um, specialized journals, uh, geospatial data, like Google Maps, Bing Maps. Um, for example, during the SCCTF, one of the flags was, who do they use for deliveries? Well, I was just driving around the building on Google Maps, and I see this big boxy brown truck backed up against the building. I was like, check, UPS. Then I went further around the building and I saw a bunch of FedEx trucks. And I was like, hmm, I almost said FedEx too, but then I zoomed out a little bit and FedEx had a facility across the street. Either way, um, you've got that. Resumes. I go and look at Indeed resumes all the time. Um, for example, Actually, I'll dial that back for a moment. The careers page of a company, they, some of them are very descriptive. Some of them, not so much. My target during the SCCTF, they were looking for an Oracle ERP consultant that had specific experience with version 12.2.5. A quick stroll over to ExploitDB, and I found a server-side request forgery and a SQL injection vulnerability. Thank you very much, and come again. People put things in their resumes because it's technologies they've used and they need to let their employers know about that. They don't have to put the specific version. Like, I have no problem saying, yeah, I used to be a Red Hat administrator on like 6.7. Okay? It's Red Hat 6.7. No big deal. It's an operating system. The, the, world, the sun's not going to fall from the sky if you find out someone's using Windows 10. Right? 
That's actually a pretty safe assumption. The sun may fall out of the sky if you find out they're using XP, but that's a completely different problem. <laughs> but anyway, so there's really only one major OSINT pioneer, and that's Michael Basil. Here are his three books. Uh, the sixth edition of Open Source Intelligence Techniques just came out. I recorded a podcast episode with him a couple of weeks ago. I'm still trying to finish editing. But uh, he actually released his own uh, OSINT-oriented uh, Linux operating system called Buscador. And it's pretty amazing. But with Michael Basil, I couldn't get a picture to put up here of him just because he doesn't allow photography of him. If you take his class, you're not allowed to take pictures. Period. I, having met him in real life, I will say there are pictures of him on the internet, but there are a lot of pictures that say they are him that aren't him. B-A-Z-Z-E-L-L. You'll see his website when we get to the demo portion. Um, the talk I'm giving next week at B-Sides Nova called Decepticon deals with a lot of the concepts that are in his Hiding from the Internet book. And it's basically deceptive engagements to make sure that, well, it's not making sure, it's just making people's jobs of collecting OSINT on you a lot harder. Because, I mean, if I go to collect OSINT on someone and they come up as a ghost, I immediately know something's up. Immediately. No one is a ghost. Either way, where can you do this? Well, bars, that's a great place. You know all the employees of... Uh, or all the students from Stetson College go to, um, I don't know, Bad Monkey, whatever, random bar. Well, you go, you hang out at that bar, you wait for them to show up, you, you have your listening ears on, you might even wear headphones with nothing playing. It's a good thing about uh, Apple AirPods, actually. People never know if you're listening to anything or not. You're like, no, I'm just a tool. <laughs> I say that, but I actually went and bought AirPods yesterday, so... <laughs> But that's mostly just because of the volume of meetings I have with work now, and I just hate having to sit there with the phone up to my ear, muted for so long. Anyway, malls. Uh, a few Christmases ago, I was walking around at Macy's, and I hear a guy on the phone with his bank spelling his credit card number out in its entirety in the middle of the store. I was like, <coughs> I couldn't hear you. <laughs> yeah, it, he didn't repeat it. For, if anyone wants a, uh, a credit card number, though, I'll give you mine. And it's 4-867-5309-9035-7684. Again, that is 4-867-5309. Yeah, there you go. I was waiting. I was waiting. Anyway, family and friends, who in here does not have a social media account? Ooh. Uh, we got one. What about... Parents, siblings, children, friends. Yep, game over. Thanks for playing. Actually, I highly... Yes? Well, there's that. I have several in my name and other names. Um, but with that being said, my recommendation is actually, if, even if you don't use it, create one in your name and one that's not in your name so that you can actually watch and see what people are trying to do and say that involve you. Because your record already exists. Would you rather be the one to control it, or would you rather it to be some malicious uh, actor that has no ethical obligation to do anything, right? Um, back windshields. I have far too much fun with this. I can't count the number of times I've almost crashed my car taking pictures of them. <laughs> but I do it all for you. Um, Forums, job boards, so on. Um, with my SECTF, I actually uh, identified, I was searching for the syntax of their email accounts. And I came across this email address, and he had been a uh, systems engineer. And he was talking about a problem with their backup solution. I was like, okay. Well, I went and looked him up on LinkedIn. He had been gone from the company for almost a year. Well, I was able to uh, use Profiler uh, which is a tool built into Recon NG to enumerate the username he uses everywhere. I went to his Facebook and his Twitter and verified it. So then I did another search, and here comes a GitHub repo. There we have Nagio scripts. We have scripts uh, dealing with Red Hat satellite server synchronization. We have a thing that's dealing with a tool called Netflix Ice, which is used to uh, estimate your AWS costs for a month. And for whatever reason, he left the company in July 2016, 
The last time he committed anything to those repos was June of 2016. Hmm. But he had a bunch of other new repos after that that were very similar. So it gave me a lot of insight on tools and technologies that they were using as well as programming and scripting languages they were using, all because I knew his username. I mean, if you pay $7 a month, you can use private repos. And a company, like this was a Fortune 500 company, you can't tell me they probably didn't have an internal GitHub Bitbucket or something along those lines. Whatever. Back windshields. What can we see here? All right. So let's think of this from a, a non-social engineering lens for a moment. We're going to be criminals for a second. We're going to break into this house. So here's what we can ascertain. Dad, he's either a gym rat and ultra ripped, or he's got a dad bod and thinks he's ripped. <laughs> He's probably, he probably goes to the gym at 5 in the morning or 5 in the evening, near daily. You might catch him Saturday mornings running 5Ks. And when I say running, I mean running like the first like quarter of a mile and walking the rest until he's like 10 feet from the finish line and he finishes strong. I, I can make that joke because that's actually what I do. Um, mom, mom's a teacher. If you're going to break in, you're going to want to do it during school hours, not on a federal holiday or in the summer. John, he plays soccer. He seems to be old enough to where he's probably playing competitive soccer. A little bit of more recon, and you can probably find out how old he is, and you can probably get his team's schedule. Neil, he's a skater. Get a Thrasher shirt and a pair of um, Etni shoes and a skateboard. Introduce him to the Misfits. I guarantee you he's never heard of them. His mind will be blown forever. <laughs> His mind will feel like mine this last week after conversing with Jack on Twitter about uh, Marianne Faithful. I don't know if you're familiar with the name. Uh, she's like Mick Jagger's ex-girlfriend. Uh, she wrote Sister Morphine. Uh, any Metallica fans in here might remember her from The Memory Remains. She's that woman, the one with the crank box in the video. Uh, but I listened to her solo work, and my mind was absolutely blown. I was like, man, Jack, stop blowing my mind like that. That's what he, he was listening to when he was doing CFP reviews. But anyway... Jessica is a curveball. We can't tell any hobbies of hers. We can't tell anything about her age, except that she's likely younger than John and Neil. Beaker and Ruby. That's where it gets fun. We can see that Ruby is a hound. Hounds howl and bark. Don't be harmful to the dogs. Take dog biscuits. That's all you got to do. It's very simple. Timing. We can't talk about timing without having some flavor flav, right? <laughs> so it's a transitioning point because you've got to take your time in your social engineering. You don't rush. When you rush, you make mistakes. With OSINT, the same thing. But at the same time, in OSINT, you, might, you may be beating your head against a wall, and then you find one little thing. You go down that rabbit hole. You're about to call it quits. And then you find something. You, re, you go right back to the beginning of the process and everything unravels. It happens all the time. It gets tricky if you're doing it as a consultant, like if you're a pen tester, because you're going to have an allocated bucket of hours. So your quality is going to vary based on that. But if you learn more efficient ways to do it, using some of the resources and what I'm about to show you, you'll have a lot better luck. And Quick attacks, they're sloppy. You have spelling and grammar errors. You might out yourself with things. Uh, you might accident, like, I always send myself a test fish before I send it to anybody else. You know, if I were being sloppy, I might accidentally send it to myself and them. Or uh, I might um, send it to the same people multiple times in a short period of time. It's like, hmm, they're testing something out. Hmm, gotcha. Anyway, so how, how do they mesh? They both have similar properties in the fact that they deal with human nature and ignorant things that people do. And when I say ignorant things, I'm not saying that people are dumb, stupid, or any of that. It's just that they may not be aware of it. We're in a time when it is normal to overshare. There are people on my Facebook account, I can tell you where they're going to dinner tonight because they're creatures of habit. I know everything they eat. I know their bowel movements. 
Because they share everything. But you get this, and you can build a better content for the context. If you know, for example, something that I learned during the SECTF, everybody in Louisville, Kentucky, they love three things. They're foodies, they love their bourbon, and they love craft beer. I'm not a whiskey person. I'm straight up tequila. Gene can attest to that. Um, and with being a foodie, eh, that's a tough one. That's too broad. So when I'm on the phone with these people, one of the flags was, what's your work schedule? So I was like, oh, happy Friday. Yeah, you know. Um, so I work in uh, the uh, internal cybersecurity office. We've got an external audit coming up. And I'm just updating the records to make sure that everything that we have is correct. Do you have a few moments? Yeah. Oh, what time do you get out of here? Oh, 4.30. Oh man, I get out of here at 5.30. I can't wait to go home. I just got this new craft beer. It's amazing. Oh, yeah, it's really amazing. I love craft beer. It's like, oh, thanks. Instant rapport. I wouldn't even have said that if I hadn't been stalking a vast majority of that company's employees and found out that most all of them liked craft beer. And if the person hadn't have liked craft beer, I would have probably took a stab at bourbon. Wouldn't have worked. I'd have crashed and burned. But, yeah. Whatever. Um, and then you can also use it to, to look for things like passwords. There's a, there's a tool on GitHub now. I didn't write it, but I do love it. It's called Passwordology. P-W-D-L-O-G-Y. And you input certain information about your target. Their spouse, their children, their parents' names, their pets' names, their dates of birth, all sorts of things. And it runs a substitution against it and builds an intelligent password list against them. These are things that you can find out from OSINT. You don't even have to talk to the person. You can go to Family Tree Now, True People Search, Ancestry.com, and find out everything about these people. <coughs> They're some of my favorite websites. Anyway, so collecting OSINT, it's all about the single piece of information. I always relate it to Weezer's Undone song, right? Because if you want to destroy my sweater, you must pull the string as I walk away, right? It's a single string that you're pulling. You're trying to unravel this sweater of OSINT so that you can make a nice yarn ball for your cat, right, or whatever. It could start with a business or an organization's name. For the SECTF, you just get the business name. It could be a phone number. If I have a missed call from a number I don't recognize, first thing I do, yep, I go searching. Ah, no, scammer, don't want it, done. Physical address, metadata. Josh Huff uh, has done some amazing research on metadata from pictures. He enumerated some people uh, with his 2016 Derby Con talk. He was able to figure out who it was that shared a picture. They had taken a picture of the gas pump, bragging about the price or griping, either way. They were talking about the price. In the reflection from the glass of the gas pump was a taillight of a car. Through a little bit of refinement and reverse image searching, he found that it was a 2006 to 2011 Dodge Durango. Dodge Durangos were available in those years in the following colors. Oh, this is kind of a grayish color, so it's this. Okay. So then he was able to look in that area and see who has that vehicle in that area. Right? You could even go further and look and see, even when, like Facebook and Twitter, they've started stripping metadata out so you can't find out all the really juicy stuff, you could still find out what kind of phone it was taken on. I mean, most people don't take pictures on cameras anymore. They use their phone. So you can find out. What was that name again? Josh Huff. Huff, H-U-F-F? H-U-F-F. Uh, He's on Twitter at Beowulf. I think Beowulf88. Um, think about those harmless surveys. I was in a Bass Pro Shop, and they're like, hey, fill out this survey, and you can get, uh, we're, we're uh, giving away a boat and a $500 Amazon gift card. Okay. And, and just so you know, that accent is very authentic. I actually grew up in eastern Tennessee. I just dropped it when I was in the Navy. The officers were making fun of me. So, like, they wouldn't take me seriously. I'm being totally for real. But, you know, depending on, like, when I'm doing the pretexting calls, if I'm calling somebody up in Alabama, I'm not going to talk like this. I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? How's your people? You know? It's just how it works. Um, I don't try to impersonate accents. Like, I would never be like, oh, good day, mate. 
I don't know how those accents work. I mean, if I'm talking to somebody that actually does speak with that accent, they're going to be like, man, this dude is full of it. Click. Oh, but anyway, the surveys. Think of what you could get out of people. If I could get permission to do so, I would love to set up a booth and give away an Amazon or a Starbucks, some kind of gift card, something of value, for people to fill out this harmless survey. All I'd ask for is first name, last name, email, year of birth, address, mother's maiden name, favorite pet's name, make and model of car. I guarantee you it would just be an absolute killing machine of gaining OSINT. If I were to do it, I would actually have a shredder right behind me, and the second they do it, just shred it. But, you know, that's part of the whole ethical thing. But I'll get to that. Um, marketing, right? Salesforce, Facebook, retail stores. We, we all know about Facebook as of late uh, dealing with the Russian disinformation, right? Pull that yarn a little bit more. You might find some stuff in password dumps. If nothing else, you can use Have I Been Pwned to find out who uses their work email for what. Public records, court records, SEC filings. It's all about the profiling. Is it once and done? Nope. You might have to do this several rounds to get it. Like the SECTF you're dealing with, in, in the case I, uh, of my competition, it was a Fortune 500 company with numerous sites. I had three weeks to collect all the flags. I spent a lot of time doing it. If you're doing it as part of a pen test, you're not going to have that kind of time. But you've got to be efficient so you can go back and refine when necessary. Here I reiterate the six principles, you know, reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, likability, authority, and urgency scarcity. So let's apply those principles to connect and contact. You know that they were on vacation in Mexico three weeks ago. Or better yet, no. During the SCCTF, one of their senior vice presidents tweeted to United Airlines complaining because he missed a meeting in Amsterdam because his flight was delayed in Newark. If I wanted to fish him, and it was authorized, which it wasn't, I could have sent him a fish claiming to be with United Airlines customer service. He would have probably taken the bait so he could chew me a new one. And then I would chew him one right back without him knowing. The subtle chew. Same thing with the vishing. If you know about your target, like I was doing a pretexting engagement, we had a guy that answered the phone, I knew he was having some baby mama drama, so I just pull up a YouTube video of a baby crying, put it in the background while my coworker that was female was having problems at Walmart and needed her card unlocked. Yep. He actually held to his guns though. Their CFO not so much. <laughs> he, he had local admin too. So with that, um, we called him up. We said we spoofed an internal number. We we're like, yeah, we're from legal. Um, this kid we go to church with, he's trying to get an internship at the FBI. Um, we knew via OSINT that this financial institution had been robbed. We're like, he's trying to get some data for this research he's doing for college. He goes to such and such school um, about the financial impact of what happens when banks get robbed. Like, how does it affect the bank financially? He's, he's called all these other banks, and they just ignored him. One threatened to call the law on him. Uh, you think you could help him out? He's a real sharp boy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. What, what email address do we have him send it to? Just send it to my work. Okay, can you confirm what it is? Yeah, blah, 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 blah. blah. Thanks. I already had the email account created. I had the email staged. I was just waiting for the email address. I waited. I think I set my timer on my phone for 7 minutes and 43 seconds, just because it wasn't some... It wasn't a standard number. Uh, then we sent it. There was a link in it. It just went to a page that said, unavailable. That was it. He clicked it not once, not twice, not three times, 15 times on his computer. <laughs> then he opened it up on his phone and clicked it about five more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. He emails me back. Hey, buddy, that link don't work. Can you send that to me as a file? So I run over to the pen test practice lead. I'm like, hey, man. I was like, I, I, I need some payloads. He's like, what you need? I was like, well, here's what's going on. He's like, all right, here's an executable, and here's a macro-enabled Word doc. All right, thanks. So I send him the macro-enabled Word doc. He opens it. It looks funny. 
He closes it. He opens it again. <laughs> His AV picks up on it. He emails me back. Hey, buddy, there's something wrong with that file. I think it's corrupted. Can you, do, do you have another file format? Can you download it again? So I just sent him the executable. <laughs> That's how we found out he had local admin because the pen test team was able to uh, take over some stuff, run Mimi Cats, and get DA in a very short period of time. Yeah. That day was a good day. <laughs> so, before I get to the demo portion, let's talk about mitigations, right? So, you can use technical mitigations, like Proofpoint, for example. It'll append or prepend the word external to the subject line. I will tell you from my experience, it slows some people down, but it doesn't work completely. When you buy the .us that goes to your target company's .com and you email claiming to be their COO that's about to be promoted to CEO, they still open it. It doesn't matter that it says external. All right, nah, that system must be broke. IT ain't doing her job again. Malware protection. It's not gonna solve, it's not gonna protect you from phishing, but the reality is you, people are gonna fall for fish. I've almost fell for fish lately because they were like really solid. Um, but you need the protection. Don't look for an absolute solution. That's just not going to happen. That's naive. Uh, IDS and updated signatures. There are some things that travel only across email. Your IDS can actually assist you with that. UBA does some things, but honestly, phishing your employees, whether you do it manually, automatically using something like um, PhishMe, that works, uh, or you could just pay a firm. Um, I'm sure John Strain and Black Hills would have no problem taking your money to fish your employees. Phishing is something I think that you could probably get away with doing without betraying your employee's trust. OSINT, on the other hand, don't. If you're going to do your own OSINT, do it exclusively about the company and company only. If you do it about your employees, number one, you could be violating laws. Number two, you're going to betray their trust. And number three, re do you really want to know that kind of stuff? Don't answer that because you probably do. So... That's one that I would certainly recommend paying someone else to do. It's they can parse out and say they don't need to know about her baby, uh, her baby daddy drama. They don't need to know that uh, he's single and ready to mingle. They don't need to know this. They need to know what impact it has on the company. And yes, I could use that baby mama drama or the desire to mingle. I could use that against them, but quite honestly, everybody's got something in their closet. Their skeletons there. Don't cross that line. Now, if they're posting a picture of their badge on Facebook, as someone that works at the company that I targeted for the SECTF did, now that, that's worth letting the company know about. Because I now know what their badges look like. I can just go to SkyDog and be like, hey, you remember that state password inspector badge? Can you make me one that looks like this? Oh, yeah. Here, step back. Let me take your picture. Thanks. You can have policies. Your acceptable use policy should, in, should have something to go with it. You should be doing awareness, and you should address personal devices. Standards of conduct has some impact, but it's limited because people are going to do what people do, and that's pretty much what they want. But you need to train them. Train them about insider threat, active and passive. An untrained user is an insider threat. It's a passive insider threat because they're not actively trying to be malicious, but because you have failed to train them, you've created your own insider threat. Train your people about social engineering and OSINT. Let them know what people are capable of. Have recurring training. I recommend quarterly. Do your hour-long training to check the box because we know that training is mandated by compliance and that's why we do it in the first place. But do the one to check the box and then do quarterly beyond that. Address new threats, new TTPs, things that you've observed. Give kudos. Then fish them some more. Base your training on the outcome of your tests. You should have employee-based training based on their role. It is not unusual for HR to have to open an email with an attachment and open the attachment, right? Somebody signs a, an offer letter, how do you think they're going to get it? Contracting, sales, accounting. They're all expected to open emails with attachments and open the attachment. They're going to be more 
prone to getting fished. Train them, but at the same time have a non-punitive policy. Don't throw the book at someone because they clicked a fish, right? If someone clicks a fish in my organization and they report it to me, nothing will happen to them. I will protect them. I will train them. The training may be painful, but they will be protected. If they do it consistently, like every single fish, 17 times in a row, that's a different problem. Take that up with HR. But train them. Integrate it with your IR plan. Yes? So a lot of companies have a, you know, I think this is a phishing email and you send it off to the stock. I'm curious about what you just described where the user clicks on the phishing email, realizes they made a mistake. What kind of mechanism is there for that in self-report that? Um, to my knowledge, there's really not one right now. Uh, so, can you expand on what you said when you, what you meant when you said... Absolutely. you report it to you, you will not be punitive, you'll just uh, train them? Thanks for segueing to the next slide. <laughs> so, you need to have a policy that clearly defines who to report it to, how to report it. Do you want it to be via email? I'm going to say probably not. Do you want it to be phone, text, Slack, smoke signals, carrier pigeons, Morse code, what? Do you have a can over your desk that they just talk into the can across the wire? Hey, if that's what you do, I can guarantee you, you're not going to have an external attacker listening to the wire between the cans. <laughs> it's going to be secure. Per you want precise actions to do. With your company policy and your IR plan and your posture for doing forensics and IR, do you want them to power the system down? Do you want them to send it into hibernation, sleep, lock the screen, Unplug it from the network, unplug it from the wall, do nothing. What do you want them to do? And I can't tell you the answer because there's no right or wrong answer. It's up to your organization. But define it and get it on your employees' desks. Like in the military, they have bomb threat worksheets on every, at every single phone. Have a phishing threat worksheet at every single computer. Use a specific color of networking cable so that you can tell someone, hey, if you click something that's fishy, unplug the yellow cable. If that's what you want to do, go for it. Make it easy. Most of your employees are not security professionals. Don't treat them like they are. It's not their role to figure out what is a fish and what is not. It's just the reality of it. Consider gamification. Don't let it blow up in your face like it did with Wells Fargo. But just think of this. If you have something of value, a gift card, a parking spot, a challenge coin, a yellow sticky of appreciation, it doesn't matter. Something someone finds of value, they will rat out their own siblings, children, best friend, lovers, whatever, to try to get that win of whatever it is. Take the doubt out of it. Don't make people try to figure out what's going on. Um, so I'm going to shift over momentarily. I've got about nine minutes total. So I'm going to shift over here really quickly, and I'm going to um, show you some tools. So we'll start out here. Um, hello, Facebook, my old friend, right? We're going to look at the, this thing called the live map. Y'all ready to do some creeping? I like to do some creeping. See if it loads, because I'm piping the internet through my phone, so... Oh no, they've changed it. I should have checked this earlier. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, they changed the UI. There was those birds that still haven't hatched. I saw that there. It just amazes me that someone will actually sit and watch that thing. I mean, these birds have been like nesting for like seven times their gestation period and still haven't hatched. I'm pretty sure there's nothing in those eggs or something. All right, so let's uh, zoom in and uh, see what we can see, if anything. They might have changed it on me. Looks like they have. Yeah, nothing's showing up here. So in, in times past, what would happen is you would have a bunch of blue dots and you could click on it and see what is live, what people are doing. You could just watch it if their setting was set to public. So with this, what I was going to do would be here on Michael Basil's Intel Techniques website, go to his Facebook tool here, and then uh, scroll to the bottom. 
And right here with video data, you get this nice little JSON output, but there's nothing here. So they've obviously caught on to it and shut it down. But it would give you the username, latitude, and longitude. And then I would then move here to Google Maps, and we would look at the outside of the building of wherever they're broadcasting from. Seems like Facebook caught on to it, so thanks, Alex Stamos. Thanks, Zuckerberg. <laughs> so anyway, let's talk about some Google Foo. <sighs> wonder what kind of juicy info there is out there. Huh. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. Seems legit. Come on. Okay. So, okay, we're looking here. Oh, here's a phone number. Here's a website. Okay, we got that. So, we know they're at Equifax.com. So, let's do this now. So, we'll do the site Equifax again. I have no problem picking on them. And then we'll do at Equifax.com. So, what we can do... If anything shows up, um, we'll probably find some email addresses. This Equifax is not really a good target for this portion of it because realistically, uh, with this you're trying to target their PR marketing salespeople. Uh, but with this, you could just go and take a look. Okay, here's this data, and then somewhere it's there. But cert and if you take the um, the site operator out of that. So, if you just do this, now you're searching the entire internet for those email addresses. It's a good place to start. Alternatively, uh, instead of going with an email address, um, I'm just going to use uh, something bogus here, but we see that on their, all their marketing material, they use this syntax uh, for phone numbers. I don't know if that's supposed to be there. I'm going to be nosy. Um, Cheese to the car, dude. Probably is. Either way, you can find phone numbers. And you, the beautiful thing about phone numbers is once you define the range, something I like to do, I block my number and in the middle of the night, I call to get their voicemails so I can confirm the name and that it's a live number. And then I can find out more about that person, like their email address, their role, etc. All sorts of fun. So that's one avenue to take. Here's the OSINT framework. This was written by Justin Nordine. I apologize, I can't zoom in on this. Um, this tool, you can find out so much other stuff. It links to all sorts of other tools. We could have an entire conference all day about this tool alone. But... What I pulled from this was I went to Edgar because Equifax is a publicly traded company. So here's some data about Equifax. Actually, right here is their SEC Form 10-K. Because they're publicly traded, it has to be public knowledge. So here we can find out all sorts of stuff. So like right there's their zip code. There's their actual address. Um, and then at some point we'll find out uh, more information about employees, like management. Um, while I'm thinking about it, let's just uh, do this right here. Uh, we'll go to Bloomberg, and let's look for Equifax. Uh, this might be a little bit tougher. Ah, uh, here we go. Mm. It's probably not the best example, but one thing you can do, like if they didn't have all the um, news on them, you can get a company profile that will tell you their physical address, some phone numbers, and all of their executives. Every one of them. It might not be up to date. I will caution you on that. It may not be up to date, but you can get it. That's targets to go after. Other things to look at. You can just go to their SEC filings page. All sorts of stuff here. Statements of ownership. All sorts of stuff. More than you could even imagine with it. Um, 
Intel techniques, this is another tool you can use. Um, if you go to it and click tools, right here you can see there are tools that deal with search engines, Facebook, Instagram, uh, domain name, IP address, YouTube, reverse image searching, paste bins, etc. And these are basically structured queries that Michael Basil have written, has written and is sharing for use. Um, to wrap things up, uh, I want to bring a little bit of awareness to, uh, one moment. Okay, uh, let me do this, just to make it easy, there we go. So I want to bring some awareness to a project that I'm working on. Uh, it's in cooperation with Peerless, it's called Through the Hacking Glass. Uh, it's a mentorship thing where you will either act as a mentor or a mentee, and we will uh, build things to allow you to learn things that you won't get from academics or certifications. Um, I gave a presentation at noon on it. Um, for more information, uh, there's the resources. Uh, I've got a mailing list for it set up. Uh, you can find a link to that uh, on any of the Peerless posts about it that I've made or on the Facebook page, uh, which is facebook.com slash hacking glass. So that's one place to go. Um, if you want to contact me, here's how I can be contacted. Pretty simply. Uh, future speaking engagements, I'm pretty busy for the year, and that's only until June. That doesn't include Vegas. Um, aside from that, any questions? Thank you. Awesome. That one? Cool.